Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's Tuesday, and that means it's time for another one of our isms. And today, I'd like for us to consider jingoism. J-I-N-G-O-ism. I-S-M. Jingoism. And a good, short, summary definition of jingoism is uh, a sort of hyper-patriotism. A patriotism that's over the top. The jingoist is the person who cries out, my country, right or wrong, my country. I'm going to be loyal to my country no matter what. If you embrace jingoism in principle, then you have uh, essentially agreed with the patriotism of the Nazis. You have agreed with the patriotism of the Russian communists or the Chinese communists. You have given essentially a blank check to whatever country is the object of your loyalty. You have taken uh, patriotism, which one could argue in its place uh, is a virtue, a loyalty to kith and kin, and elevated it to this place of an idol. We're not supposed to be so loyal that we never feel any shame. We're not supposed to be so loyal that we never feel a desire to not be associated with our nation. You know who wasn't a jingoist? Rahab. Rahab was probably, for most of her life, uh, a proud Jerichoite. But in God's providence and in God's grace, at some point, she began to have her doubts about her own people, about her own city. And as she heard about uh, the grace of God at work in the lives of these Hebrews that had come out of Egypt, she began at some level to feel some kind of loyalty toward them so that, such that, when the spies that were sent into Jericho by Joshua uh, are being hunted for by the uh, army there, Rahab takes it upon herself to hide them. And she gives complete misdirection to these soldiers looking for these men. Oh, they went that away. When in fact they had not. And she pronounced after this her allegiance to God's people. You know who else did that? Ruth. Ruth was from Moab. She was a Moabitess. And the Moabites were not particularly close friends with the Hebrews. But she did marry one who was sojourning away from the promised land down into Moab. And when he died and Naomi was ready to go back to the promised land, Ruth said, And treat me not to leave you, but whither thou goest, I will go. And your people will be my people, and your God my God. She is saying, I've looked around at Moab, and it's not a good place. It's not a place where widows are cared for and protected. It's not a place where the God is true and honorable. But Naomi, what you're describing, I want to be a part of that. Ruth is not a jingoist. Now, friends, 
One of the ways that we find ourselves falling into jingoism is we're sort of reacting to the absolute lack of patriotism from people on the left. There are people who will cry out, my country, wrong and wrong, my country. That is not my country. I hate my country. No matter how I look at it, all I'm going to do is see the negative and the awful things that my country's done. I despise my country. And those people tend to be people, I, I'm guessing, to the political left of most of you listeners. And wanting to push back against that, we can find ourselves falling into jingoism. There's a profound difference, for instance, in celebrating and rejoicing over the sacrifices that were made by the greatest generation during World War II, when the United States was attacked by Japan and the Germans declared war on us as well, and saying, you know, wherever we send soldiers abroad overseas, we're the good guys. Mm, not necessarily. There's a difference between loving your country and embracing the virtue of empire. In fact, we did imperialism on one of these isms a few weeks back. I'm opposed to it, wholeheartedly opposed to it. I think the Bible's opposed to it. So you won't find jingoism in me. Am I grateful for my country? Absolutely. Am I grateful for my founding fathers? Absolutely. Do I think my country is extraordinary? Absolutely. Do I think my country is perfect? Absolutely not. Am I loyal to my country? Yes, I am. But I'm more loyal to a better country whose builder and maker is God. That's what I'm looking forward to, like my father Abraham. So be careful. Be careful that in your legitimate, wise defense of an appropriate level of patriotism, that you don't fall off the other side of the horse into jingoism. Tell you a little story, and it won't take long about a lazy farmer who wouldn't hoe his corn. The reason why I never could tell, for that young man was always well. He planted his corn in the month of June. By July, it was up to his eyes. Come September, came a big frost. All that young man's corn was lost. Everybody's busy. Busy, like wealth, however, is a relative term. My old friend Eddie used to marvel that I took a full load at seminary while working a full-time job. What he didn't realize was that I had studied rather much of what was covered in seminary when I wasn't busy before seminary as a teenager. Nor did he understand that once I took lounge around the pool reading People magazine out of my schedule, I had plenty of time. We feel poor because we fail to be grateful for what we have. And we feel busy because we fail to be grateful for what we're able to accomplish. We suffer from the folly of Lot. He had received God's richest blessing and then got confused over what that blessing was. By living in close proximity to Abraham, Lot drank deeply from the collateral benefits that came his way. His flocks prospered. He had an increasing number of servants to tend those flocks. But those servants found themselves at odds with Abram's servants, and Lot chose the Lot next to the heathen. He thought the wealth came from him. He thought the combination of his shrewd business sense, his eye for fine grazing land, and his hard work was the source of his prosperity. 
He, no doubt, mentally shook his head at his uncle's failure to negotiate wisely when Abraham offered Lot the pick of the land. Proudly, then, Lot surveyed all that was before him and chose the green place, conveniently overlooking the rainbow flag flying over the adjacent town. He noticed, no doubt, the lovely window treatments on the homes, but apparently didn't notice that Sodom's birth rate was 0%. Now, I'm not denying that God works through means. Rather, I want to affirm that while God was the source of Lot's prosperity, the means God worked through wasn't Lot's hard work. Instead, it was the character of his uncle. But more important still, it was the very wisdom of his uncle that was the wealth. What made Lot a rich man wasn't flocks and herds, nor South Beach property, but that his uncle was a man of wisdom and character. What made Lot a poor fool wasn't that he failed to tend his flocks, but that he failed to tend his soul. Here is a great paradox. Jesus often taught in paradox. He twisted words that we might see reality, not because we are twisted, but because reality is. Lose your life to gain it. Be last to be first. Die that you might live. Isn't a literary technique, but the substance of reality. C.S. Lewis got at this point. Actually, I think in one place or another, C.S. Lewis alluded to virtually every point there is to make. But he got at this point in the screw tape letters. There, Screwtape encouraged Wormwood to encourage his charge to think in grand categories and to fail to think in the small. A man who can taste the heady draft of a love for humanity but can't force himself to love his neighbor in the pew has already lost the battle. Cultivating a love for humanity, however, is like growing plastic fruit. One need not worry about root rot or bugs, and one can display the, quote, fruit of one's labors. But the real deal isn't there. Lewis, however, missed an even bigger point. It isn't enough for the wise man to move his gaze from the amorphous humanity to his neighbor in the pew. If he would do better still, he must turn his gaze inward. What he should be looking to, if he would love both his pew neighbor and the body of Christ around the globe, is his own soul. The only way to be outward looking, in other words, is to look inward. Of course, there is a deadly and deadening navel gazing. Analysis paralysis is not what I'm calling for. It wouldn't have done the lazy farmer any good had he, instead of frequenting the parties in the surrounding culture, instead stood in the midst of his growing corn just to look at it. No, friends, we look to ourselves that we might be at work in ourselves. We look inward because what the world needs now isn't simply one less sinner, but one less sin. The kingdom grows not through, but as we put to death the old man, as we put on Christ. 
But there's still another layer of paradox because, paradoxically, not only does Jesus work through paradox, but so must the devil. We lose our lives when we seek to save them. We become last when we seek to be first. In like manner, the devil is about the business of lulling us to sleep or encouraging our spiritual sloth. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and we are as unconscious as the foolish virgins. The rest that the devil seduces us with, however, is nothing but slave labor. When we are not diligent about the business of bearing much fruit, we are instead busy either making excuses or pushing rocks up Sisyphusian hills. Changing the world is chasing after the wind, changing ourselves in and through the means of grace appointed is running the race. The devil who is more crafty than any of the beasts of the field seduces us into waiting for that beast in the jungle, that one glorious moment of opportunity where we will usher in the kingdom with our devastating argument, our best-selling book, our cinematic triumph, our Christian president, Meanwhile, the beast is at work in our hearts, where the real battle is, where he turns our gardens into jungles. All there is, is abide in me. Before we dicker over what this means, let's remember what we know. We are to bear fruit. The answer to abide is found in him. For therein is his glory. A certain farmer went out to sow. But this farmer scattered no seed on the rocky ground. This farmer the one whom Mary mistook for the gardener, has promised that having begun a good work in us, he will complete it until the end. The great thing about the call to cultivate fruit is that we are the fruit that he is cultivating. The great thing about the call to work out our own salvation in fear and in trembling is that it is he that is working in us, both to will and to do his good pleasure. As we work in all diligence, we rest in the arms of Jesus. And one day, all his bundles will bow in joy before him. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.